and welcome back to Tuesdays with Tuesday. I'm Tuesday, and I write fantasy fiction under the name Mary E. Toomey. And today, I'm reading you the next chapter of my book, Taste. This is the cover. Isn't it so pretty? Look at how not pink my hair is in my picture. It's pink now. We just do what we want today. So, today is chapter 11. Grab something to drink. Sit, get cozy, grab a blanket, get ready. Here it comes. Chapter 11, Switching Sides. Tonga looked wild and totally unperturbed by the patches of mud and dried blood caking her dark skin. She was focused on me, but my attention was only set on escaping crazy town. I tried to right myself from the hands and knees position on the floor to escape, but one of her hands swung down and caught my arm. Her metallic nail attachments sliced deeper than a finger had a right to. I hissed in surprise as blood pooled at the cut and began weeping down my arm. I snarled, fed up with a fight I didn't understand, but somehow found my sm myself smack in the middle of. I leapt to my feet, returning her slash with a punch to the throat, since she was much taller than me. I straightened while she choked, her eyes widening and then narrowing as she recalculated the threat I was to her. I punched her three more times in rapid succession, not holding back any of my rage. Back up, you ass Jack! I don't even know you! When Tonga was doubled over and in too much pain to fight, Mason positioned himself between Vaughn and me, growling, I swear, like a dog. Well, that was good timing. I didn't understand why it seemed like he was protecting me from Vaughn, of all people, but I wasn't about to complain. Mason was switching sides, protecting me when he'd just been twisting my spine like a jerk. Ezra wasted no time wrestling a frenzied Vaughn in the foyer. The two locked in what looked to be an emotionally painful struggle. It seemed Vaughn wanted to lose as the two scraped and tumbled. When Ezra finally pinned Vaughn to the floor, still somehow flawlessly unruffled, his voice was gentle. Easy, son. Easy now. It's just a little blood. Breathe through it. I think I'm all right, Vaughn said, as if he'd been the one to get cut. I'm sorry, October. I've got her, Vaughn. Go get some air. Mason inched closer to stand at my side. His hairy arm wound around my stomach and yanked me away from the gasping Tonga, flinging me behind him and smacking my back to the foyer wall. The filthy bug woman had only just recovered from my punches, but Danny and Vaughn were already wrestling her to the floor, binding her hands with a few zip ties. She seemed happy to let me escape those few feet in the same way hunters get excited talking about Bambi when it gets too close to open season. King Gion sent me for the omen, she growled, her stomach pinched to the hard wood by Danny and Vaughn, who wouldn't negotiate. All he wants is her, not anyone else. You'll be spared if you just give her to us. Mason spat a thick wad of grossness on her face, making me cringe. That's how I found Tonga. I heard you were narrowing down on locating the omen, Ezra, so I came to offer my assistance. Intercepted Tonga on my way here when I learned her plan was to abduct this one he said, with a, jerk in my, with a thumb jerked in my direction. I think Tonga will make an excellent sacrifice. Ezra's voice was grim. King Gion has overstepped before, but never so clearly as this. Sending someone to steal the omen? He shook his head in disgust. Then let us send a message, Ezra. Vaughn finally regained his composure, standing with Ezra when it seemed Danny had Tonga under control. Vaughn's shoulders tensed slightly in front of the man I could tell he was viciously protective of. Though Mason was burlier, the fire in Vaughn's suddenly malevolent eyes reminded me of the inmates who would smile kindly to lure everyone into a false sense of security, only to slit someone's throat if they took cuts in the chow line. I plastered my shoulders to the wall to distance myself from every freaky brand of psychotic surrounding me. Vaughn's voice had an edge to it that belied the smile he had in place. Does King Gion really think so little of Ezra's security that he'd send you here to take what doesn't belong to him? The omen belongs to all of us, Tonga screeched. Vaughn tisked her like she was a petulant child. I almost want to let you escape so you can go back to your almighty blowhard of a king and tell him what a sweet little teenager you beat, uh, beat you up. I wanted to correct him and mention that I was actually 22 
but now didn't seem the time for semantics. Vaughn met my eyes and gave me a nod of solidarity that served to center me in the midst of the insanity. I couldn't speak, so I bit down on my lower lip and nodded my compliance in return. I decided that, of all the monsters I was surrounded by, the vampire was the least terrifying. Half vampire, I reminded myself. Danny caught our little exchange of trust, and I could see the wheels of a plan turning in his head. He picked up Tonga's head and slammed it hard to the ground, knocking her out in one fell swoop. I know how to prove October's an omen. If I can do that, she can be awakened today, yeah? He asked Ezra. Ezra rubbed the back of his neck. I suppose, but I need more proof than just her bones being harder to break. Danny rose from his perch atop Tonga and moved past Mason to face me. He was expecting a conversation I was expecting a conversation or something, not his stupid giant muscles slamming me back into, against the wall in the foyer. I let out a scream when Danny pulled a knife from his belt and pressed it tight to my throat. Danny, stop! Vaughn and Ezra cried in unison. I expected the tip of the knife to puncture my skin as Vaughn lunged for Danny to get him off me, but Danny didn't cut me. Instead, he reached for a trickle of blood on my arm, dabbing a little on the tip of his finger. Smell that? Danny taunted his brother. You're a sick man, Vaughn. You want to drink her blood, don't you? Now Vaughn was trying to get at me, his eyes wild with fight as he tried to push Danny out of the way with his fangs bared. He'd gone from the only one I could kind of trust to ravenous for my blood on a dime. Danny, no! Ezra cried, trying to separate the brothers. Danny held his red-painted finger out to Vaughn. How about just a little? Tell us if she's part human and part matriculin. It's better than Mason trying to break another of her bones, yeah? Danny looked perturbed at Ezra's shouting, addressing only his brother with a look of faux sympathy. You've been so good, abstaining as you have. Tell me what she tastes like. Pure human? Or a little something extra? We need the confirmation. You'd be doing us a service by having one little... No! I screamed, afraid of the monster I could tell Vaughn didn't want to be. Vaughn, you don't want to do this! Vaughn lost his mind and threw Ezra to the ground with an inhuman roar, popping Danny's finger into his mouth. No one expected Danny's right hook, least of all Vaughn. Vaughn hit the ground and stayed there, though I knew he could have gotten back up to return the punch. She's both! Vaughn choked out. She's half human and half from Tearaway. Definitely matriculin. He writhed on the ground, fist clenched in his hair as he gnashed his teeth. How could you do that to me, Danny? He roared, utterly beside himself. More. Now that I've tasted her, all I want is more. No, Danny! Now Danny's body acted as a shield to keep Vaughn off of me as the vampire leapt to his feet and lunged for more of my blood. I'm pretty sure I screamed as I closed my eyes to brace for the end of it all. Ezra's arms went around Vaughn, jerking him back. Son, remember yourself. You don't want to do this. When that didn't seem to deter Vaughn from reaching for me again with his frenzied fingers, Ezra shouted, There are extra blood bags and honey bottles in the kitchen. Run! As soon as Vaughn fled the temptation, Ezra whirled on Danny. Have you no pity for your own brother? He's doing his best, which is a far sight more than you're doing to help matters. I don't care what you think. I care that this one's awakened. I care that Marianne gets a break. If Vaughn can help, it's the least he can do. I felt for Vaughn, who was trying not to be a monster, and despised Danny, who couldn't care less that he was. I hissed at the sting of the cool blade that returned to my skin. Danny pushed the tip to my jugular, glaring into my eyes that refused to shrink. I would not be small in front of these psychopaths. If they wanted to keep me here, it would be the worst decision of their shortened lives. This was not my first time being held at knife point. It was my tenth, at least. The first time was a teenager who took my backpack on the way to school, the dummy. All I had in there were books and homework. I ended up failing that American history assignment, though, and was convinced that my dog ate my homework might have held up better than a knife-wielding wielding thief stole my homework, I swear. I hadn't cried then, and I wouldn't crack now. Danny was tall and muscular, 
but I was scrappy. I held his venomous gaze and returned it with one of my own. Don't move an inch, he seethed. Mason swore. Danny, stop! His burly arm wrapped across Danny's shoulders to, cut his, to cuff his hand over Danny's throat. If she bleeds, you go down, brother. We need her alive. Do it, I dared Danny. You want to cut me open? Do it, you pansy! Don't tempt me! Danny's thin lips snarled at me. He had a square-shaped head, and when he was livid, he had a passing resemblance to Frankenstein's monster. I could practically see the bolts in his neck. You're lucky I actually need you alive, or I'd have handed you over to King Gion for testing. You think you hate Mason and me? Gion is far worse. Ezra and Mason were shouting for Danny to drop the knife. Danny, don't. We need her alive. That's the whole point of it all. My back was still aching, but I muscled through the sting, glaring into Danny's blue eyes with just as much hate as he focused on me. Why are you hesitating? You've got me right where you want me. Do it, you wuss. Mason hissed at me. You're not helping, kid. Danny released a little of the pressure when Mason's grip tightened around his neck. As Danny's knife pulled away, Mason's arm retracted so Danny could swallow again. I knew I had exactly two seconds before Danny convinced himself my head would look fabulous mounted on his wall. I pulled the cheapest, but most effective, shot and kicked him straight in the groin, ducking to the left, just in case he came back for a stab. As he doubled over in throbbing pain, I grabbed the back of his head and slammed it down into the wall above the baseboard, kicking him in the side for being a jack wagon. Tonga's nails sliced through the zip ties I'd known couldn't hold her for long. She was on her feet and lunging for me as if I was the one who kidnapped her. October, run! Ezra shouted, his knife raised as he readied to defend his home. Instead of running for the front door, I bolted toward the back of the house into the kitchen, certain I could find an exit somewhere. The flies were everywhere, and Vaughn was heaving in big gulps of air as he sucked on a juice pouch. He paused his drink and motioned me toward the pantry. Hide in there until we get all this sorted. I didn't bother arguing, but shut myself inside. I heard shouting that told me the fight wasn't a clear win for us, though really I was still trying to figure out whose side I was on. I grabbed what I needed from the pantry in case I was brought back into the fight. It wasn't my best plan, but I'm no Bruce Campbell. Homeboy would have had his broomstick in hand and a, a boomstick in hand and a five-part plan he'd execute with a roguish smile on his face. I was just trying not to break down into tears. I pocketed what I needed before the door was flung open, a bloody razor-clad hand reaching in and gripping my arm, slicing deep enough to make me stop thrashing so she didn't hit an artery and cause a real mess. Finally, she breathed, King Gion's going to have fun with you now after all the trouble you've caused me. I could tell she was summoning up gumption or serenity or magic or something ominous to start the next phase of her plan. She opened her mouth, and hundreds of white moths flew out like vomit, encircling us in a cloud of white. And that is the end of chapter 11. We're doing so good. Aren't you proud of yourself that you're listening to like a whole book come at you one chapter at a time? I'm proud of you. I'm proud of myself for reading it aloud. This is not my forte. If you couldn't uh, surmise that by all the mistakes I made, I apologize to Bruce Campbell because I said broomstick instead of boomstick. Egregious offense. Please forgive me. I hope you guys have a lovely week and I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>